Welcome to the Super Abundant Life Podcast, where we teach the Bible in a simple, authentic, and practical way so that Christians can skillfully apply the Word of God to create supernatural results in every area of life. This is your host, Olaomi Brigway. So this week, I'll be teaching you a very simple and practical method to grow any area of your life. So we've established that you shouldn't be just content with having an area of your life, not where you want it to be and thinking, well, I can't have it all. So once you've identified that, "Uh -uh, wait, I can't have it all, then clearly you begin to see that there's certain areas of your life that you are not particularly happy with. And the question next would be, okay, so then how do I now bring these areas to the point where I'd like them to be or to the level that I'd like them to be in? So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be sharing with you a very simple and practical method, or you could call it a tool that I have personally used for many years to help me literally grow different areas of my life until I can confidently say from where I'm standing, I have it all. It doesn't mean that I'm just stagnant and not growing. I keep growing, but I can't really point to any area of my life where it feels like I'm significantly falling behind compared to the other ones. Do you understand what I mean? But I didn't start that way. So that's the encouragement. I'm not coming here and saying that so that you'll feel like uh, uh, there's only 30 people that can have it all. I certainly <laughs> did not start that way. In fact, I started way below average compared to other people, way below average. But I was determined, once I caught sight of this idea that, "Uh uh-uh, wait till God wants me to have it all, then I was determined to go for it, which is what I'm encouraging you to do. Now, this tool that I'm talking about is called a personal growth plan. A personal growth plan. And in this episode, I'm going to be walking you through why you need a personal growth plan and indeed how to create one. So I'm going to activate my teacher mode (laughs) in this episode and literally walk you through it in a very, very simple way. The first thing obviously would be, (laughs) what is a personal growth plan? By my own definition, very simple definition, a personal growth plan is a simple action plan that maps out in clear detail the goals that you have for your life and how you intend to achieve them. It's as simple as that, okay? It's a simple tool. Notice that I keep using the word simple because I hate complexities. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I hate complicated things. I believe God is the simplest person you will ever meet. I believe that God is not complicated at all. If anything is complicated and I'm struggling to do anything, I normally would just take a step back and say, no, no, no. It's not supposed to be this hard. It's not that deep. (laughs) It's not that deep. Jesus was very straightforward, very simple. In fact, he was so insistent on removing obstacles from the paths of people. It was the Pharisees, on the other hand, that were like, no, you must not heal on Sabbath. You must do this first. You must do that first before anything can happen. I was like, you people step aside. I want to heal on Sabbath. That's it. (laughs) So very, very simple. All right. So it's a simple action plan that maps out in clear detail the goals that you have for different areas of your life and also how you intend to achieve them. My second question is why do you need a personal growth plan? So why is it necessary? And I'm going to give you a few reasons. As I mentioned earlier in this podcast, number one, because God expects you to grow. Sometimes I feel like we have painted God like he's just this very laid back, like anything goes kind of thing. Oh yeah, you've been stuck in that job for 10, 15 years and God is just like my daughter, my daughter, I love you. Now he does love you, But have you read other parts of the Bible that teaches the character of God? Do you understand what I'm saying? Have you read about the parable of the vine keeper where uh, the owner of the vine showed up and there was a particular vine that was not bearing fruit. And the owner said to the vine keeper, what's going on? Cut this tree down. 
and the van keeper said no oh, wait now let us put some fertilizer around it let's just tend it for a few more years you know let's give it three years or whatever it is and then the vine owner said okay fine fine <laughs> he, he was he had to be convinced he wasn't like oh you're right he was like okay fine whatever but when i come back in three years time if this vine is not producing fruit we're cutting it down do you know that's talking about god there's an aspect of God that we tend to just brush aside and say, oh, oh, but God is just okay. You know, stagnation is not really, he's not bothered. He's still like, okay with it. God is not okay with stagnation. God expects us to grow. In fact, he doesn't tolerate stagnation. That is why the Holy Spirit won't leave you alone. Haven't you noticed? When you just want to coast, when you just want to hold on to that bad behavior, that flaw in character, and you, you are happy to just be like that. But the Holy Spirit will not leave you alone. Especially if you are walking diligently with him, he will not leave you alone. He will keep talking to you about that thing. He will keep nudging you. He'll keep saying, come up higher, come up higher, come up higher. That's how God is. So God expects us to keep growing. I mean, when he created Adam and Eve, when he created human beings, he said, be fruitful, then multiply, then expand, dominate the earth, fill the whole earth. That is how God views our lives it's not meant to be just stagnated in whatever area god doesn't settle for stagnation okay so that's the first reason and probably the most important reason because the person that we live to please is god the second reason is because you probably will have one or more areas that you need to work on so as i said in the beginning of the podcast in last week's episode, I brought your attention to the fact that you should have it all and you shouldn't settle for, okay, fine. My family is fine, but the career that I truly want is not happening. So well, as long as I have my family, that's okay. No. So when you begin to think like that and you bring all areas of your life into view, it is very likely that you have at least one, two or three areas that you're like, "Mm, well, these are not really where I want them to be. Now, because of that, you need a plan. You need a plan because trying to go for everything at the same time, you most likely will get overwhelmed and then you will abandon it. And you'll be like, oh, hey, I didn't kill Jesus. Let me just, <laughs> let me just settle back. Do you understand? So that's why you need a plan. You don't want to be overwhelmed and you don't want to, as Paul said, be the kind of person that is boxing the air. So you are doing all these things. There's no clear plan and it's not yielding any results. That's one of the quickest ways for you to abandon that project and give up on it. The third reason (laughs) is, oh my goodness, it is impossible to grow meaningfully in this information overloaded world that we live in without an intentional plan. I mean, by the time you scroll through Instagram for, I don't know, maybe even 10 minutes, you've seen like 50 million quotes. You've watched like, you know, or at least scrolled past like 10 million videos, all saying, teaching you different things. This one is encouraging. This one is saying, do this, this one is saying, do that one, da, da, da. And these things are wonderful. I mean, the internet is a wonderful thing, but the idea that everybody can now create content and publish content, (laughs) and a lot of people are, means that, oh my goodness, overwhelm galore. (laughs) Like you don't even know where to begin. And very recently, I actually reevaluated my growth plan because I'm like, I'm overwhelmed, right? There's just too much information coming at me what how much of that information that i'm even taking into my head is helping me how much of it have i actually moved forward with to create something tangible in my life and i could not say a significant number so i was like no then this has to stop because actually it begins to mess with your mind and jesus said to whom what is given much is expected so the more you gather and you know the more you fall under condemnation that you are not doing it. You understand? The more you fall under condemnation, you read a book that tells you, oh, you should be like this, you should be like this, you should be like this, and you completely agree. And the book is telling the truth. 
but because you've moved on or there's something else that catches your attention, you become distracted and you never really follow through what that book is telling you to do. The next moment or the next time you find yourself in that situation where that book had been telling you to improve, you will feel condemned. Because you know what you should do and you know what the right thing to do is. But because you haven't really settled down to do it, condemnation comes. And I was living on that condemnation in the sense that, oh, I should be doing this. I should be doing this. I'm like, stop. No, no, (laughs) I refuse to live like that. So I began to streamline. I seriously began to streamline. Okay, which is what a personal growth plan will help you do. I mean, you can read many, 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 many books, right? And that's great because at least you're you're being exposed to new information, but you should definitely have a plan to be implementing what you're reading from at least one of those books. You understand what I'm saying? We are overloaded with information. And as Paul says, knowledge puffs up. Knowledge actually creates a false sense of pride. So I already know that. (laughs) I already know that. But if we look at your life, what is the evidence that you know it's fruits? Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. So the way you know (laughs) that you truly know something is if you are bearing fruits with it. But if I can't see the fruits of that thing in your life, what you only know is knowledge that is stored in the brain, which is not doing you any good. So these are things I basically started telling myself, like, uh, 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 uh. so I began to seriously streamline. And a lot of these changes have actually impacted the way we are, we now run Super Abundant Woman. So, because I'm like, no, it is a platform that literally simplifies spiritual and personal growth soft skills growth for Christian women that are multidimensional, that want to achieve it all, that want to have it all in every area of their life. Now, if we're overloading them with information just for the sake of it, I mean, I had to sit down and ask myself, am I doing what God called me to do? I mean, it may be popular to keep bringing out all these new, new things that get people excited. But then I sat down and I thought about it that, allow me, when you've experienced the greatest growth in your life, how did it happen? And I realized that, ah, it happened through repetition. You're sticking one thing until I broke through with that thing. As, as a result of that, it took a lot of courage. And if you're super born now of my listening to this, it took a lot of courage, oh, for me to f- pull through or to follow through with those kind of changes, like with 5 a.m. club, chapters book club, a lot of courage because I'm like, hey, well, you know, people are used to seeing it this certain way and doing it certain way. But I had to be honest with myself and I had to be true to the calling of God upon my life. And it is amazing that at the time of recording this podcast, the feedback that I have received about how, for example, the 5am club has radically transformed lives. Because me, I was doubting. I was like, hey, is this thing I did? <laughs> I just knew that it was something that I needed to do. And I knew that I had to follow through with it. So when I started getting reports back about how just meditating on the same scriptures for a cycle has literally exploded people in their areas of life, I'm like, God, thank you. Thank you for showing me or reminding me of these things and giving me the strength to follow through. So you need a personal growth plan. Because do you know what? You can end up reading 20 books in a year. And by the end of that year, yes, you have gained knowledge. But if you look at your life in general, have you applied any of those things? You can join this course and join that one and join this one and join Instagram lives and and all these things. But have they really impacted your life? You understand? So it's good to do all those things. That's what I'm saying. But you need to be able to create a plan and say, okay, when I join this Instagram live, this is what I'm going to do with it. This is how it is contributing to a particular goal that I have. That way you won't find yourself just being puffed up with knowledge. And the truth of the matter is it is impossible for you to grow meaningfully if information is what you have. Do you understand? You haven't learned anything, really, even though you may know it in your head, until that information has been exercised into experience. 
So for example, I can sit down and I can read all about swimming. I read all about swimming and say, oh, okay, so when it gets into the water, this is what you do. You flap your whatever like this, blah, blah. You can tell that I'm not a strong swimmer, right? <laughs> okay. I can't survive, okay? <laughs> but, <laughs> so I can read all about swimming and et cetera, et cetera. I say, oh, I know. You can even be trying to teach somebody that's in the water and tell them, do like this, do like that, do like this, or move your leg like this. But if they throw you inside the water, you will be crying and say, hey, save me, Jesus. Abby, am I lying? So until the knowledge or the information actually gets exercised into experience, you haven't really learned that thing. So that's what we're saying. So that's what the personal growth plan will help you do to translate all this information, streamline them into some kind of experience that will then grow your life. And the last reason is this. People tend to set the wrong goals when they're reaching out for growth. So for example, they look at an area of their life and they think my finances are not really up to speed. I want to improve my finances. And they set a goal like I want to save 10,000 pounds by the end of this year or whatever it is. That's just me throwing a number out there. Or I want an increase in salary. Or I want to be happy in my marriage. Notice that what they're doing is they're setting what goals. This is what I want. This is what I want to achieve. This is what I want to have. Can you see that? That's what people tend to do. When actually what you should be doing is setting a personal growth goal, which is a who goal. Who, not what. <laughs> so set a goal for who and not what. Because when you become the who, the what automatically flows into your life. But if you're chasing the what, I want an increase in salary. After a while, you keep asking your boss, you keep asking your boss, you keep asking your boss. If they say no, 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 you get frustrated. Meanwhile, you are still exactly the same person. When you started asking for the raise, you haven't changed. You haven't improved in any way. You haven't acquired more skills, but you're like, I just want an increase in salary. I just want an increase in salary. On what basis? And if the what that you are chasing does not come to you, frustration enters and say, it doesn't work, Joe. Let me just not set goals. No, it's because you're setting the wrong goals. You're setting your sights on the wrong thing. Now, I'm going to talk a bit more about that when we come to actually creating your personal growth plan. So those are the reasons why you absolutely should have a personal growth plan. And I like to work in 90-day cycles. A year is long. It's not that long, you know, in context of our entire lives, but a year is long, ago. a year is long in the sense that, you know, 12 months, 52 weeks. And considering the fact that we're so distracted nowadays, we live in a very, very distraction prone society and world. So I like 90 days because 90 days, you can just say, okay, 12 weeks, three months. And you can just basically zone in on that and say, this is what I'm going to achieve in 90 days in context of what I want to achieve in a year. So you set your goal for the year as normal, but don't just leave it as a year. You have to break it down into 90 days, but I'll talk about that in more detail. So what I'm going to do next is to walk you through how to create a personal growth plan. So number one. The first thing that you need to do is something called a will of life assessment. I like this assessment because it is visual. So I'm a visual person. I like to see things that I'm talking about. A lot of times if someone is trying to tell me something or maybe try to read something to me, I'll be like, let me see it for myself. Because when I see it, I actually understand it better than if I'm just hearing it. Some people are auditory. So they actually learn better by hearing. I learn better by seeing. So this is good for me because it basically just helps you see the analysis of your life or the assessment of where you perceive you are in life, in every area of your life, in one go. It's a very visual tool. And I'll just basically walk you through how to do that. Or you can Google Wheel of Life and you will see se several examples. Like I said, we will also have the image for you in the PDF. So to create a Wheel of Life assessment, or to do your will of life assessment, you need to create a will of life. And it is basically a circle, 
the wheel of life is a circle that is divided into sectors, equal sectors, that represent the areas of your life. That's all it is to start with. So you have a circle, and then let's say you want to divide your life into six important areas. You would literally draw six lines, or three lines, I should say, that will help you divide that circle into six equal areas. What are those kind of areas? So let me give you an example of what those areas of life could be from my own personal experience, from my own personal example. So I have seven areas that I tend to put into my will of life when I'm doing this assessment um, in no particular order. I have spiritual life, I have parenting, marriage, finances, business for you in my big career, health and fitness, and social. And social, what I mean by that is like relationships beyond my immediate family of my husband and my children. And that encompasses pretty much anything. It also encompasses social impact. So how am I relating and impacting the people in the community, in society, includes things like friendships. You understand what I mean? So anything that gets you relating with human beings outside of your immediate family, that is what I call social. But you can have your own categories and it's entirely up to you how many you want how many sectors you want to divide your wheel of life into so once you've divided your wheel of life into the number of sectors that represent the most important areas in your life then you label them what you now do is for each sector so let's say spiritual life for example you go there and you mark on each line within the circle to indicate where you think you are in that area. The center of the circle represents zero and the circumference of the circle, I'm taking you back to a maths class now, (laughs) will be 10 or 100% depending on how you want to view it. So the center of the circle is zero. So for example, if I say that uh, spiritual life is a three, which it is not, (laughs) If I say spiritual life is a three, it means that you basically just try and estimate. So you don't need to take a ruler and and divide it into 10 equal parts for one to 10. You don't need to do that. It's just an estimate. So try and see where between the center of the circle and where the line touches the circumference, where do you think three will be? And you put a mark there. And then you do that for all the sectors. And once you have all the marks that indicate where you are in each area of life, you join those marks together. And another thing I want you to do is then color it in. It's lovely when you color it in because it just gives you this nice, very vivid picture of where your life currently is. You understand what I mean? When you see the PDF, you will see what I'm saying. I'm not sure um, I'm explaining this exactly as I should, but the picture in the PDF will help you. So once you've painted it in, so different colors for different areas of your life, you can literally hold it up and say, aha, this one is like pumping. (laughs) It's doing so well, but what is going on over there? So that's the first step. The second step, step two is based on your will of life, you then identify the areas that you know you need to grow in. Now, remember that this is a very, very personal assessment. This is not even one that you share with someone and say, okay, tell me, what do you think? It's personal to you because it's a personal growth plan. Someone else's perspective of you might be different. What counts is how you feel about yourself. So for you, someone might look at you and say, ah, your finances is a nine, you know, you're doing very well. But in your own eyes, you might think it's a six. Put a six because it's about you and how you view yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you look at the whole circle, which is your will of life. And then you look for areas where there are significant or noticeable dips based on what you've marked and you've colored in. So which areas stand out as needing some level of improvement, then write it down. All right. Then step three Remember I said the reason why, one of the reasons why you need a personal growth plan is because you may identify two, three, four, or even five areas. Now you're going to be overwhelmed, discouraged, and even crushed if you try to go for all five, for example, at the same time. So step three is to choose one, (laughs) one area to focus on. 
And people always fight me with this. They say, oh, but why one? Oh, can't it be three or four or ten or two million? And I say one. One is okay, especially if you're going to be working in 90 day cycles. Why one? Because one helps you to focus. Remember that you already have so much going on in your life. And this is a personal growth plan that, listen, as much as you want to grow, growth is actually the thing that gets the least attention in our lives. I'm telling you, personal growth or what some people call personal development. Like read a book. We have to be chasing you to read a book. <laughs> Do you understand? Because you're busy at work. You're busy at home. You're busy doing other things. And to sit down and read a book, you might be thinking, oh my God, you know, I, I need to read a book. So the things that will cause you to grow tend to be the ones that get the least attention. So if you bear that in mind, and then you now go and try and put it as highest priority, when you know, when you know by yourself that it is usually relegated to the back of the line, you're already going to fail. That is a plan that is set up to fail. So I say one thing so that you can still get on with all the different areas of your life. You can still get on with your work. You can still get on with raising your children, doing well in your marriage or whatever it is. Meanwhile, you only have this one thing that you're going for. And, you know, if you say I'm going to assign uh, one hour or 30 minutes every day to my personal growth, you know that you're really hammering one particular area instead of spreading yourself thin. Okay, so I always prefer to go for one thing at a time. Then the next thing is, how do you then know which one to choose? How do you know which one to choose? So I said, pick one. And I've just told you why I recommend that you should only pick one to start with. So how do you then pick one? Two criteria. Number one, if spiritual life is low compared to the others. I would always encourage you to start there. <laughs> Spiritual life, like prayer life, st Bible study life, you having a nice, intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, you are full of peace, you have joy that's coming out and oozing from that relationship with God. I mean, you may face challenges, but even in the midst of challenges, you are not overwhelmed or overrun, rooted, grounded spiritually. If that is not solid you should always start there because out of that flows everything else once spiritual life is sorted once you can get back into the flow spiritually literally everything else begins to flow out of that so always start with the spiritual life if it happens to be low and the second criterion is similar to the first one if spiritual life is fine and then you're trying to say okay which one should i pick use this rule which one, if I sorted out now, would have the biggest impact on my life? Or which one would give me the biggest sense of satisfaction if I worked on it and achieved it? So the second way to streamline and pick one is to ask yourself this question. Which one of these areas that I need to improve in, that if I sorted it out now and I grew in this area, would have either have the biggest impact on the rest of my life. So for example, if I sort out my finances, it means that my mental health will be stable. I will no longer need to be worrying about money. I can provide more for my children, etc., etc. So you can think that way, which one's going to have the biggest impact on the rest of the areas of your life, or which one is going to give you the biggest sense of satisfaction, like confidence, like a boost in confidence. Like, yes, I'm on the right track. I'm doing well. So that's how you determine which one to pick. Step four. So you now identify the one area that you're going to be moving forward with over the next 90 days. Step four is to clearly state the outcome you desire in that area in terms of the who, not the what. Remember I mentioned something like this earlier. In terms of the who and not the what. Let me give you an example. So someone says, oh, my relationship with my teenage daughter is not really working, you know. I wish it was like this. I wish it was like that. And this is what a what goal sounds like. They'll say something like, I want to have a great relationship with my teenage daughter. 
I want my teenage daughter to be able to talk to me, etc., for us to gist and laugh, etc., etc. That's a what goal. But this is what a who goal sounds like. It says, I parent my teenage daughter with acceptance, with patience, and with respect. That's a who goal. That's you setting a goal for growth to become that person as opposed to like putting a wish out there that I want a great relationship with my daughter. And here's why. Let me explain to you why you should do it this way. You can't really control the outcome of a what because there are other factors involved. And a lot of times those factors will be out of your control. So you're saying, I have a great relationship with your daughter. Is it not dependent on your daughter too? You understand what I'm saying? Are you going to force her to have a great relationship with you? You can't force her. You can only hope that she, she wants a great relationship with you and she participates in being, you know, the kind of daughter. Do you understand? You understand what I mean? I gave the example that someone that said a what goal that I want an increase in salary. It is dependent on your boss or whoever it is to decide you get that increase in salary. I mean, can you force them? (laughs) You can say you want it, but whether you get it or not is dependent on somebody else. So there are certain factors that are out of your control. But if you say, I'm going to set a goal to be the kind of person to grow my skills, acquire new skills, grow, etc., etc., and improve myself, You take it out of the hands of even your line manager because you open yourself up to other possibilities that will get you that outcome. So the only person you can really take 100% responsibility for is yourself. And because it is yourself, you should set goals that will grow you because you have 100% control over yourself, over nobody else. No, you don't. So set your sights on becoming the best version of yourself in that area and the best version of yourself, that new self, that is the best version of yourself, whatever that person, that new you deserves will effortlessly flow to you. So that person that goes and increases their skills and, you know, gains more knowledge and, bec- and, and improves their expertise. So they're showing up, creating more results, speaking up at meetings, etc. They've grown. People will notice and say that person has grown. And as a result of that, they will promote you and give you an increase in salary. Can you see? Instead of putting the eggs in somebody else's basket that I want my, I want an increase in salary. And you keep talking to your boss and your boss says, well, sorry, no. You understand? So that is why you should basically do that. If you set a goal to have a great relationship with your daughter, that will be your focus. As I said, you will keep doing things externally to try and make it happen. And in some cases to try and manipulate that thing into happening. While you as a person, you've remained exactly the same. You're still the same person. You are still the same parent. You still talk to your daughter the way you talk to her. You still judge her. You're still doing all those things, but you are pursuing the great relationship without you changing. No. Even if you try to do nice things like, oh, I just bought you this new dress without her asking. But if you're still the same person that is judging her, that aura (laughs) will certainly still come through regardless of the good stuff, quote and unquote, that you're doing externally and it will aggravate the situation rather than help it. So focus on your own growth. Set a who goal, not a what goal. Let me give you another example. Instead of setting a goal to, let's say, as I mentioned earlier, save 10,000 pounds in your account or have a savings of 10,000 pounds by the end of the year. That's a what goal, right? You just focus and say, meaning you will hustle, you go and find different things. If you're really committed to making that goal happen, you can do anything to get it to happen. And then once you've saved the 10,000 pounds, what next? You may still be exactly the same person. You understand what I'm saying? But here's a difference. If you set a goal to be the kind of person who creates and lives by budget that then allows you to, let's say, put aside 10% of your earnings into a savings account every month without fail, 
you are setting a who goal and that who goal will serve you much better in the long run. So when the person said the what goal of 10,000 pounds must be in my account by the end of the year, they can maybe go and take on three more jobs just to scrape the money together. But are you going to keep those three more jobs? It's just a short, very myopic way of setting goals. Have you grown? Meanwhile, maybe the real problem was the fact that the person does not know how to handle money. They don't know how to handle money. And you know what will happen if that person remains exactly who they are, but they do external things to scrape that 10,000 pounds together. I give them another three months. They will blow that money. They'll spend it because they haven't grown personally. Yeah. So that's step four. Moving on to step five. Now that you know what area you want to grow in the next 90 days and you have clearly set your who goal, step five is then to kickstart the law of synergy. So I talked about the law of synergy extensively in the previous episode that I mentioned at the start of this episode. Go and listen to that episode if you haven't heard it. This is how God actually makes sure that he can have it all. The law of synergy basically says to leverage other people's expertise and strengths in the areas where you are currently not strong. It's as simple as that. So step five is to identify your personal board of directors. Who are the people that are going to join you on this journey to provide the strength where, remember, in this area, you are quite weak. So if it's spiritual life, okay, and you're like, my spiritual life, I find it very difficult to pray. I find it very difficult to read the word consistently. I find it very difficult to just basically have my mind renewed and consistently stay in a state of peace and joy. Someone might say, okay, I'm going to join Saul because that is what Saul helps you to do. That is what I mean by a personal board of directors. I say board of directors, but I don't necessarily mean that you should have more than one person. In fact, because it's 90 days, I would only focus on one person. And let me also qualify this. A board of directors, it could be literally a human being in the form of like a mentor or a coach. So you can say, I'm going to go and engage with a mentor for 90 days or a coach for 90 days to help me in that particular area of my life. Yeah. It could also be a book. So somebody wrote that book, somebody that is thriving in that area that you want to begin to thrive in, but you don't have intimate access to them as in one-to-one contact, but you can through their book. So you can say, okay, I've researched and I found that this book is very practical. It's not just a book that will say, you must do this. This is good for you. And then doesn't show you how. So I'm talking about almost like a manual. So you may need to combine books to get exactly what you want. So for example, the book, How Women Rise, I recommend this book a lot. Someone says, I want to increase my salary or I want to grow at work. I want to get into senior leadership. That book basically talks about 10 habits that women need to master in order to grow up the career ladder at work. So it's the kind of book that also helps you define clear action points. And I'm pretty sure it's one of the books that we're going to read in Chapters Book Club in so very soon. That's what I mean. Not just a book that inspires and makes you happy. And then what what shall we do? You don't know. (laughs) So try and find a book or a combination of books that will help you do that. So a mentor clearly or a coach will help you do that. Not just inspire you, but also give you a clear action plan or steps. It could be a course. The same thing. Make sure it's not just a course that makes you feel happy and there's no action plan that follows it or explicit steps that you should take. All right. So anything along those lines, write it down and say, so you may not literally be able to write this down in the moment. You may need to take a couple of days, go and do your research and then come back and fill that part in. But you must, you have to say who is walking with me on this journey. The Bible says two are better than one because they have a great reward for their labor. If one falls down, the other can pull him up. So you need somebody that God has already positioned in your life, like Aaron and her, I talked about this in the last episode, that will help hold up your hands so that you can have absolute victory in that area of your life. 
All right. So that's the first one. Identify your personal board of directors. It could be a combination of a, a mentor or a coach, uh, a book or a series of books or a course or whatever it is. You can be one. It can be three. Don't have too many, though. OK, because then information overload also sets in. And then secondly, as part of step five, hire them. <laughs> Get them on board. That's what I mean by hire them. Engage that coach. Go and meet that mentor. Buy that book. Sign up for that course. That's the next step. As part of step five, identify who your Aaron and her are and then engage them. Lock hands with them and do it in such a way that you are committed. And I say, hey, I'm written it down. And then set yourself a target to say, make sure you have hired your board of directors by this particular date. Okay? And then step six is... Now you have your personal board of directors locked in. You now need to map out a clear plan for that quarter. And when I say plan, so let's say, for example, you get two books that, you know, address that area well. So it gives you the knowledge, it gives you the inspiration, and then it gives you the know-how. So exercises that you can carry out to grow in that area. So what do you do? You have 90 days and you have your clear who goal that you have set for yourself at the end of that 90 days. This is where you are. You are at point A. You are going to be this person at point Z. Map it out and say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to read this book or I'm going to follow through with this course. I'm going to etc. etc. Make sure that the plan takes you through a clear path of progression from where you are to where you want to be. So you could say that by the end of month one, I have mastered this particular skill, for example. So I gave the example of like How Women Rise, which is a great book for career progression, particularly for women. So you can say there are 10 habits. Maybe out of those 10 habits, there are six that you think you are really struggling with. So your plan is to start reading the book. Okay, by the end of month one, I've you know mastered and you know I've overcome the fears and the hindrances that relate to two of the habits. I've begun to practically walk in them and express myself in those habits. And then month two is these two habits. Month three, do you understand? Don't just say, oh, I'm just going to read How Women Rise for 90 days. No, that's not a plan. It has to have a clear plan of progression from zero to wherever it is you want to be. Okay. And finally, step seven, once you have your clear quarterly plan, your plan for the 90 days, break it down into weekly targets break it down into weekly targets so by the end of week one this is what i would have achieved by the end of week two this is what i would have achieved and by the end of week three this is what i would have achieved right now it is 12 weeks so you can plan out which i recommend the 12 weeks but you don't have to i would say at least the first month, which is the first four weeks, plan it out and say, this is where I will be. And then literally go for it. So for example, you could say eh, by the end of week one, I have read chapter one of the book. I have done out my insights and I have put into practice what the exercises told me to do. Remember, this is not just about reading a book and then moving on. It's about you growing and changing. You understand? It's personal growth. So you can do it like that, or you've booked a meeting with your mentor or your coach. Now you have your first session, you agree a plan, and then you work on that plan in week one until you see them again, etc., etc. The reason why you bring it into a weekly thing is three months. Again, that's why I said in the beginning, don't even do a year. Do a year, but break it down into 90 days. But then don't leave it as 90 days because like, ah, I have 90 days, I have three months. And you be like, I have time, I have time. Day one, I have time, I have time. 90 long days. You just find out that it's day what now? Day 70. And like, oh, I haven't really done this thing. And then you would want to try and cram everything into the last 20 days. Of course, you're going to fail. I mean, that system is set up to fail. So when you break it down and you are tracking it and reviewing it weekly, it just keeps your eyes on the ball. You stay focused on it. And yeah, 
That is how you create <laughs> a personal growth plan. Remember, there's a PDF waiting for you to download in Saw if you're a super burnout woman, go into the podcast folder in the Saw library and find this particular episode. The link to download it will be right there. If you're a podcast listener that is not a super burnout woman, then all you need to do is there'll be a link in the show notes, wherever it is you're listening to this episode, click on the link, put in your name and your email because we want to follow up with you uh, regarding these things that we're sharing with you and literally download and get started. The PDF will also be, is it editable or fillable? Whichever way. I think people exchange those two words. Basically, if you want to type on your computer without having to print it out, we will do that for you as well. Okay. I very much look forward to hearing your feedback. You can share your growth plan with me. When I say share with me, I don't mean the whole document. This is a personal document, right? But you can maybe share something with me and say, this is what I've decided to work on. And it's also when you put it out there, it's also for accountability as well. So I look forward to hearing from you. Don't forget to share this episode with someone if you know that it will help them. This is Allow Me and I will be back next week. Bye.